welcome everybody to the Fascial Manipulation webinar. The idea behind this is to provide you with the opportunity to find out a little bit more about fascial manipulation and also the chance to speak with the key presenter, Julianne Day, who we've got to talk to us from Italy today. And I just want to go through a couple of slides to explain what we're just going to go in the next little hour. And my name is Doug Carey. I'm the coordinator for AF Education and we host the Fascial Manipulation courses here in Australia on behalf of the Stairco Institute. A bibliography was sent out to everybody, so if you haven't found it, it will be amongst your spam or junk, and that was sent out about four hours ago. Um, question format for this evening will be along the lines of, if something pops into your mind, type it into the chat on the sidebar, and then what we'll do is that we will get you to um, hold off on actually asking them. We'll have them there as a reminder. And when Julie's gone through her presentation, we'll tackle them one by one. And then just finally, to give you the heads up, we do have the level one hyper course, which is a combination of three days of online material and three days of face-to-face -face with Julianne. And that's later on this year in August. Um, and we're having that in Sydney this year. So that's where this is all heading towards. So if you enjoy what you are hearing tonight, or you have a strong interest in treating the fascia, then this is the course for you. Okay, so uh, good evening, everybody. Um, most of you, it seems to be evening. So um, I'm, my name is Julianne Day, and I'm a physiotherapist. And I um, actually live and work in Padova, Italy, which is quite handy because the Stecco Institute is in Padova. And... Uh, on the left here, you see the logo for, or the, the, the symbol for fashion manipulation. And the logo is uh, Manus Sapiens Potens Est, which means that a knowledgeable hand is powerful. And so if we um, know more about the um, fascial system, then we can be more effective in our treatment. Oh, I'm just going to mention again the, the hybrid course that Doug already talked about, just a couple of sort of practical things to say there. And I want to do a few highlights on the human fascial system. So those of you who are interested in the fascial system, um, I, I just wanted to talk about a couple of things that I really like about the fascial system. Um, I've been uh, studying and working with the Steco Group since 1998. So I've been around for a while and uh, I, I have a personal love, let's say, of the anatomy of the fascial system. Um, I'm going to do a bit of an overview of the biomechanical model because that's what you'd learn if uh, when you do the courses, the assessment procedure, a, a quick case report. And I just want to talk about some of the mechanisms of action. So how could it be possibly working? So... Um, I've given you this information both in the bibliography about signing up for the course, but uh, I really want to underline the fact that you get 16 hours of online lessons if, when you sign up. Um, so there's lots of details, anatomy and physiology, so much more than what I'll be able to tell you now in the next 45 minutes. So um, you go through clinical reasoning processes for uh, fascia manipulation, how to treat treatment strategies, etc. But most of all, you learn also the location of the key fascial points uh, that we teach on level one. Okay, the thing I want to point out to you is that you need to do, go through those 16 hours before you start the 1B, which is the practical part, okay? And the 1B B will be running this year in Balmain Sports Medicine Centre. Um, in Victoria Road, just on the outskirts of, of the centre of Sydney. And so you have to have done your online lessons because you actually have to do a little test. There's three segments and you do a test at the end of each one and going through, getting through successfully those tests, then you get a certificate and that allows you to proceed to 1B. And we ask you to send us a certificate, certificate before you actually come to 1B and then you... Um, uh, or, or you could bring it on the first day, perhaps. Okay. So, uh, I can see I've written 2B there, but it's actually 1B. Um, we've got 
a summary again when you do come in together on those three days on the 20, between the 25th of August and the 27th. Uh, but most of all, we'll be refining your manual work skills, your palpation skills, the procedure about assessing, looking at case studies. One thing I want to point out, and I'm sure Doug gives you this information, you practice on each other. And so then you need to wear comfortable clothing. So you just feel like you can sort of get right down to the skin level. Okay, so what is fascia manipulation? Are we talking about a manual method? and it's based on a new biomechanical model for the human fascial system. It's been developed by Luigi Stecco, who is a physiotherapist from Italy, okay? And as therapists, we use this model as a guide to analyze and treat fascial dysfunction. Now, we're talking today about level one, but there's also level two, and those two combined together deal with the musculoskeletal dysfunctions, but there's also level three and level four, um, where we address internal dysfunctions. And it, and level three and level four obviously address internal dysfunctions, which are also related with musculoskeletal dysfunctions and vice versa. So, okay, Luigi Stacco, you can see here on the left, um, physiotherapist has raised these two fantastic children who are now adults and have kids of their own. Uh, Carla Stecco is a orthopedic surgeon uh, who then shifted to uh, studying anatomy. So that she's now a professor in anatomy at the part of a university. Um, Antonio Stecco is a physiatrist or specialist in physical medicine, um, medical doctor clearly, and he uh, is involved in teaching at the Rusk University in New York and does a lot of research into the physiology side of uh, the fascial system and also the clinical research. So it's pretty interesting family. I must say that behind this family, there is a big team of researchers, a lot of collaboration with other universities at the present time. So uh, they really have um, you know, expanded their field. So when we um, talk about fascia, Okay, uh, I meet a lot of people traveling around. I, I mean, I te I've been teaching since 2003, so I've traveled lots of different countries teaching. And people say, oh yeah, I work on fascia too. And I always think, well, what are you actually working on? You know, which level are you working on? What layer do you think you're affecting? Um, because there are different layers. There's a superficial fascia, there's a deep fascial layer, which includes uh, perimesium, epimesium, endomesium, the intermuscular sap to the periosteum. So that's more clearly related to the musculoskeletal area. But there's also a neural fascia. So that surrounds our nerves and our vascular, neurovascular bundles are also made of fascial tissue. And there's no interruption between the deep fascia and the neurofascial, neurovascular bundles. And there's also the visceral fascia. The visceral fascia surrounds all the organs. So we really have to be talking not just about fascia, but a fascial system, okay? And a fascial system that all interacts with one another and can all have repercussions on one another if there's some problem in one particular area. So they have precise layer organizations, even though they have very similar histology, but their function varies a lot. Okay, so clearly in level one, we focus on deep fascia and the musculoskeletal aspect. So if I look at that as uh, this drawing, as a kind of a basic uh, you know, template that I can think about, uh, where, what are we talking about? Where is the deep fascia? Where is the superficial fascia? So if I go from the skin and come down to the epidermis and the derma, the next layer you get is what we commonly call the hypodermis, right? This two yellow layers with the red. That middle layer is actually the true superficial fascia, right? But this whole group of the two, the superficial adipose layer and the deep adipose layer, it works together as a, a unit, if you like. Okay, so they collaborate together extremely well. Now, Carla does a whole lesson on superficial fascia in the level one online lesson. So no need for me to go into depth, but it's really interesting because superficial fascia is involved in metabolic exchange, fat control, thermal regulation, and the passage of our superficial nerves, vessels, 
and lymphatic, lymphatic vessels run through this fibroelastic tissue on the way to their target organs. But we focus in level one and level two, we focus on the deep fascia, okay? Um, which clearly surrounds limbs, okay? Surrounds muscles, but we also have around the muscle itself, the epimesium, within the muscle, the perimesium, and then around every single muscle fiber, we have the endomesium. Now, the deep fascia tends to be more involved in proprioception. So those of us who are involved in movement and you know how we be able to move, uh, that's so fundamental for us to know. And also peripheral motor control. So getting people to do exercises, we need to have their fascia in an optimal state so that they can be in, in performance, optimal performance. But even the deep fascia in itself is divided into two groups. Uh, you know, we can classify them according to their fiber quantity in terms of collagen fiber as opposed to elastic fibers. So a pyneurotic fascia, type fascia, deep fascia, has a very few elastic fibers. It's not really able to stretch that much at all, okay? And we're talking about the fascia that surrounds the limbs, okay? So this is the anterior thigh, this is the knee, and this is the deep fascia that surrounds the, the thigh muscles. And then we also have a, a, the thoracic or lumbar fascia, okay? So here we're looking at the thoracic or lumbar fascia, and, and look, I can see the collagen fibers running in one direction, running in the other direction. Thoracic or lumbar fascia has three layers, and onto the middle layer inserts the gluteus maximus on one side and the latissimus dorsi on the other side. So you can imagine the pulling that happens through the thoracic or lumbar fascia from one side of the body to the other. Likewise, we have the rectus abdominis sheath. This is the belly button or the umbilicus. Yeah? And you can see there the collagen fibers running from one direction to another. Slightly different again is the epimesial type fascia. And we're thinking about the epimesial that surrounds the muscle. This is so it's thinner than the aponeurotic type fascia that you can see here, where we're looking at the gastrocnemius here. Okay. So this is the posterior calf region, gastrocnemius. They've cut away and folded back the aponeurotic fascia that covers the calf muscles. But you can see that shiny tissue there, that's the epimesia. Okay. And it's thinner, more elastic, so moves very closely attached and inseparable, really, from the underlying muscle. But also, interesting, in the deep, in the superficial trunk muscles, we have a different organization um, of um, the muscles. Um, in the superficial trunk muscles, like pec major, latissimus dorsi, um, even deltoid, has a different fascial structure. So we can see it's quite complex. How do they study the fascia? Okay, how have they looked at it? And as we mentioned before, in the bibliography, uh, all of these articles that I have written down here are available. A lot of them are, uh, you know, free access. They take little pieces of the fashion, and we're looking at the crural fashion, the posterior leg. Okay, so they take a little piece of it, and then they look at it under the electron microscope. So what they did when they were doing this study in, in 2009 was that they actually discovered that the deep fascia is, is a complex uh, multi-layer uh, uh, tissue, okay? And it's made up of parallel collagen fibers. Each layer has a different orientation. And between each layer, we have uh, loose connective tissue, which allows for slide. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at loose connective tissue. It's mostly adipose tissue. Then you can see one layer of collagen fiber running in that direction, parallel to each other. Oh, this layer looks a bit of a mixed, you know, mixed match here, but it's actually because it's been cut on an oblique. Okay, so if we look over here, we can see one collagen fiber layers running in this direction, one collagen fiber layers with parallel fibers is running in this direction, and another one in this direction. So we can say that the deep fascia is a fantastic kind of stretch material. I usually say, gosh, if they could 
you know, patent that into sort of stretch genes, it would be a super hit. But well, let's have a look what happens here when we actually move it. So this is a superficial uh, uh, tissue here, the superficial fascia. We have that superficial adipose layer, the deep adipose layer. We're looking at an ultrasound of the fascia lata. Okay, so the, 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 the head of the ultrasound has been placed on the outer thigh region. And from in, we come down from below the superficial fascia, we get to that um, three layers of deep fascia. Okay, so the fascia lata is actually one of the thicker fascias that we have in the body. So it's kind of easier to see those three layers there. And see how you see the white line is the collagen fiber, little black line is the dark adipose tissue, loose connective tissue between the next layer and the next one. Now in this, and, and of course under here we have the muscular tissue or the vastus lateralis. Okay, so I hope everybody's oriented there. So we asked the patient to do an isometric contraction of their, of their quadriceps. And you can see that here, there still has to, even though there's no joint movement, isometric contraction, there still has to be a little bit of sliding gliding between those layers. Now this is healthy uh, sliding gliding, perfect fascia, okay? And that's what we need to always have, that ability to move a little bit. And as I said, if we can think of this as an isometric, no joint movement contraction, just muscle contraction, uh, you can imagine how much sliding or gliding might increase if you get joint movement. So the deep pressure is a kind of, it, it, it's a complex organization, okay? It's not uh, just wrapped around the outside of the muscles, okay? Because part of it attaches to bone through the intermuscular septum, the tendons. Part of it is free to glide. And you can sort of get that from this photograph where we're looking at a, a dissection by Carlos Tipo. Uh, we're looking at the anterior shoulder. This is the pec major. And just by pulling on the forceps, okay, you can see how part of that fascia is free to glide. But what's most interesting, I find, is that the pec major fascia continues on over the uh, fascia of the biceps brachii. Okay, there's no interruption here. Okay, and they're called myotensis insertions. Okay, but the other thing that I found fascinating, which I never heard about when I was studying anatomy way back in the day, uh, was the insertion of muscle fibers onto the inside of the deep fascia. What's that mean? Every time this muscle contracts, it's going to stretch and pull on the deep fascia. And look, you can see again the collagen fibers, they're running in different directions. But look here where the muscle fiber actually inserts and has clearly been worked over the years. It's got a reinforcement in collagen fibers there. So there's a direct relationship between the fascia and the muscle. Biceps brachii, we're looking at the anterior elbow region here. This is one of the better known myotendinous insertions, the Lacertus fibrosis also known as the bicipital neurosis. Biceps, okay, we know it has its origin from the scapula and the cochlear process and insertion on around the radial head. But hey, it has its fascia that continues on into the forearm. There's no interruption here. What does that mean? Every time I flex my elbow, I'm going to tension also the fascia in the forearm and vice versa, okay? So, we have to be asking ourselves, why is that happening? When I first um, started studying with Luigi Stecco, and, and uh, there wasn't any of this information out there. And particularly when Carla came along as a medical student and then as a, you know, she was uh, specialized in orthopedic surgery. She said the first thing we've got to look at is the innovation. So if this tissue is involved in our movement system, it has to be innovative. And her first literature uh, research was one article by Yaya saying that the thoracolumbar lumbar fascia was innovated and another article by Bogduk saying, no, it wasn't, didn't find anything. So there was nothing out there. And so her first studies were directed towards the innovation. And in 2006, she published her first article 
where she showed that the deep fascia and, and consequently other layers of fascia are really richly innovated. Free nerve endings in the brown, another free nerve ending here, lots of free nerve endings, interesting receptors because they're polymodal. Um, they can change from uh, you know, receptors of stretch to receptors of pain. Um, we have uh, so from uh, Makana receptors to notriceptors. We also have Ruffini corpuscles and Pacini corpuscles. Okay, and just recent last year, they were able to publish a systematic review of the literature about fascial innovation. So it's in that 16 years, there's been so many articles coming out about fascial in innovation, and that's been a new aspect, uh, you know, about learning about this tissue. Now, this type of innovation that we see here, which is taken from the deep fascia, suggests a proprioceptive role because of the type of Makana receptors that are found in the deep fascia. In fact, if you think of those receptors embedded, say, in your pet major, okay, in the fascia of the pet major. Whenever you move your arm, okay, whether it be through adduction or interrotation or flexion, you're going to be setting off and stretching and activating receptors, okay, within that tissue. And that's going to give you very precise information about the degree, the angle, the amount of force, and so you're getting information from the periphery that's feeding back into your central nervous system and obviously helping you be on target. I like to say that the fascial system is like our GPS for movement, okay? It's got its fine coordinated GPS points that tell us exactly if we're moving. But you can imagine that it needs to be in a normal, healthy state to be able to give us the right information. So this is a, a wonderful slide from uh, uh, Nozaki, I think it's from. I haven't quoted him here, but uh, they managed to remove the muscle fiber, okay? So what are we looking at? We're looking at the, the fascial skeleton within the muscle, okay? So this is where a, muscle, a single muscle fiber would have been, right, in this space. Um, and I'm just wondering, are, are you able to see my pointer? Small detail that I should have asked you for. Doug, yes, Julie, you we can see your points are moving over the slide. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, because I, I, I use it quite a lot and then I forgot to ask if it was there. Um, so this is where a single muscle fiber would have been. And this is the endomesium, okay, and how it continues on to the adjacent muscle fibers. So it's a honeycomb type of setup, okay, endomesium. We know that the muscle fiber bundles are surrounded by perimesium and then the whole muscle is surrounded by epimesium. So just imagine how that needs to be all sliding, gliding for us to get the correct uh, activation of our muscle fiber. Okay, just a couple more photographs. Uh, as I said, I, I love the anatomy. So the pec major, just think about it. It's so, uh, you know, it's, it's complex, isn't it? We have a clavicular head, so this is a clavicle up here, and it has a clavicular head of, of muscle fibers, and that, when it's activated, will stretch a certain portion of the adjacent um, biceps fascia. There's no interruption there. But if we, we're using more the sternal head, we're going to get another direction of activation. And so within this tissue, the receptors give us a perfect information about our movement if it's in the correct state. Posteriorly, same setup. This is latissimus dorsi. It has this really significant myofascial expansion or myotendous insertion that continues with the triceps fascia without any interruption at all. Okay, so when we think about our patients, you know, that they might have some issues with shoulder movement, but they're saying, but my pain is back here. It's not actually, you know, it's around my scapula, you know, it's not actually in my shoulder, but I just can't seem to move my shoulder. Okay, maybe they come to you with an MRI of their shoulder and there's nothing really there. But if only we can get this type of connections into our head, then we can understand how a lack of sliding perhaps here could then affect any ability to move the shoulder. Okay, let's talk about the actual method itself. So uh, Luigi Steckel uh, first published in 1987. 
uh, in Italian. So he put out quite a number of books in Italian before he actually got published in 2004 for the first time in English. Um, Course of study in Italy in 1994, and you know, we the books are now translated into about 15 different languages around the world. And fast track to 2023, we've got more than 50 FM teachers teaching in a, over 50 countries. I think that's supposed to be 2015, actually, that, because Carla published her Functional Atlas of the Human Facial System, which is a fantastic uh, book. Not exactly a coffee table book, but uh, wonderful photographs of the fascial system. And, and these are the photographs I've been showing you now. There are other books, of course, because there's the internal dysfunctions uh, a subject. And there are, there's also this interesting book, if you're into acupuncture, where Stecker has compared acupuncture, Western medicine, and fascial manipulation, how they differ and how they are aligned. Um, I was lucky enough to edit this book in 2018, where I asked 15 practitioners uh, to give me case reports and talk about their experience with FM. I asked them specifically because these were people that actually inspired me to keep going through the years because they were people who are very well versed in their own uh, areas and they didn't actually need FM at all. They were, you know, top of their their line in terms of chiropractic, physiotherapy, medical doctors. They got into NFM, a lot of them become teachers in the meantime. So, you know, they've stuck around and we still meet up regularly. There's also this nice little practical guide to fashion manipulation that I want, and it's in the bibliography. It's quite simple. It's a good one to give to colleagues who are interested in FM and also read it yourself. So we like to say that the FM model, the Stecco model, is a simplification of a complexity. Okay, so the fascial system is complex, guys. It's not easy to get your head around. But he's done a wonderful job giving us a way to go. Okay, so what he's did, done has divided the body into 14 segments. The basis of this is we have to get away from muscles that are, have oranges and insertions that move joints. Because it's actually not how we move, okay? We're actually moving by activating and disactivating motor units, okay? The brain doesn't know anything about muscles and we lose a lot of time perhaps studying muscles, but it's not exactly how we're moving. So what if we think about movement in terms of body segments, where each segment is moved on three planes by six myofascial units? Myofascial units, this is all really explained in much more detail in the lessons. They're basic building blocks of the, of the myofascial skeletal system. Uh, they have mon motor unit, we're looking at motor units in monoticular and bioticular muscle fibers that move a body segment in a specific direction, the joint, of course the nerve and the vascular components, the fascia that connects it all together. So just one quick one is the myofascial unit for knee extension. Think about your quadriceps group. It has monoticular components with the vasti medialis, lateralis, and intermedius. But the biotic component is the rectus femoris. So there we have it. We have the packet of monoticular and bioticular muscle fibers. And we think about knee extension, we hardly ever use the whole lot. We just activate parts. We activate the motor units that are necessary to do the particular tasks that we have in mind. So whether that's kicking your goal in the World Cup, or whether that's kind of shifting the cat out of the way as you try to open the door. You know, we're going to be activating an enormous difference, but we're still doing knee extension. A different amount of motor units to bring about the task. So where does the fascia fits in? Well, actually, Stecco worked out that the fascia uh, is the place where forces from muscle fibers converge on the deep fascia. And so, we're going to have areas that are called centers of coordination. This is what you study on level one. Centers of coordination, myofascial units, and each myofascial unit has its center of perception. And that's where the movement is perceived, okay? So you can imagine if something is not happening correct, not sliding correctly here, you know, that little bit of sliding that we saw previously in the video, something's wrong there. You're probably gonna get incorrect 
muscle motor unit recruitment. That will alter your joint movement. Not initially a lot, but maybe in the beginning a little bit, and slowly over time, you might start getting pain, and then you get potentially joint damage issue. Okay. But clearly, we're not just motor myofascial units separated from each other because of those myo tendons insertions, the biarticular muscle fibers. They all join together. So muscle myofascial units that work in the same direction are anatomically linked by these uh, biarticular muscle fibers and insertions. So that's why we work on the three planes of space. Okay, so in level one, we study all the myofascial units on these three planes of space and understand how you know, they could be connected together. So think about your patient who's turning up in your office today with an Achilles tendon, just on one side, he's a runner. Why does he have both, been running both feet? What's the difference? So then maybe we'll ask about his history. Ah, oh, there's a bit of previous back pain. Yeah, I had a bit of an SIJ joint problems on the right. And so we trace back, you know, and I'm sure a lot of you do this in your work anyway. But we, now we have a tissue that helps us to get there. A, a sort of an anatomical understanding of the tissue that helps us to get there. Clearly, we don't just move on three planes. So there's also things called centers of fusion. It's more something we look at. It's something we look definitely at level two and the nice little patterns of diagonals and spirals and how they're involved in complex movements. So just I oh, want to whiz through this because I just wanted to give you a, a heads up, okay? So in FM, we use an assessment chart that's specific. You learn how to fill it in on the online lessons and we go over it again when we get together. Don't panic. It's just a subjective examination. We do use abbreviations, but we also have the objective examination part, okay? Um, and it's just a useful tool for us to work our way through and understand how we're going to uh, treat. We focus a lot on just the normal things that we always ask our patients, but mostly a lot on concomitant previous dysfunctions. We'll look at other things like extremity symptoms, surgery, et cetera. But all this is explained in the lessons. But we're particularly interested in the chronology. What happened first? What happened then? What happened after? So our interview at the beginning, you can imagine, can be you know, a bit more extensive than where's your pain, get on the on the plinth type of thing. Okay. Movement verifications, you'll see, super easy. You go through this again on the online lessons. We'll do it again when we get together. This is looking at the knee movement, you know, just the normal kind of looking at things where um, looking at the direction of movement, we look at it on three planes of space just as most physios do anyway, okay? And if we get the lady on the right going, that she's doing, you know, the lumbar segment, we're examining that with these particular movements of the, of the low back, et cetera. So, you know, just normal sort of movement verifications. We have movement verifications for each segment. And, you know, it's good for new grads. It gives them a kind of a baseline. Oh, how would I look at this? How could I look at, you know, uh, a segment as opposed to another one. We then we do a palpation. So the palpation of the knee segments say we're going to palpate those centers of coordination. So there's six around the knee. So we're going to do all six and we're comparing it. So the colleague here is palpating one at a time and is asking the patient, what are you feeling? Any pain going anywhere? So we're looking for lack of sliding, also called densification. And we're looking at, you know, is there any pain? Is there any referred pain? Okay. So we're shifting our mindset from muscles to the overlying tissue. We're going to know what this tissue is doing. Okay. Um, we've done a bit of a study about the inter and intraoperator reliability of these evaluations. And if we do them together, the movement verification and the palpation, then it's pretty reliable between uh, you know therapists. But that you can read that article if you're interested in that aspect. A bit of a case study. We've got a 53-year-old female with a right shoulder pain. She's a physio, 
had pain for more than two years, typical limited range of movement, flexion, abduction, external rotation. She was an early athlete, doing a lot of discus and javelin throwing. So yeah, probably overuse there in the, in the shoulder. But she's also playing basketball as an adult. She's had a history of trauma. So we get down the history. What happened first? So the first was that the carpal tunnel syndrome, bilateral. Then she had a injury in her chest, quite a nasty uh, bruising there and, and you know, pain ongoing. And then five, year, five years ago, she started getting epicondylitis. So this is our lady. And uh, so the idea is that lack of sliding in the fascial system could come about because of immobilization, structural overloading can cause it, metabolic disorders, surgeries, and of course, traumatic events, okay? So this is the lady pre-treatment. And so right shoulder is limited, inflection, abduction is uncertain there on the right. This is the treatment. Okay, I'm gonna show you again, it's quite quick one. Immediately after treatment, movement is restored. So we deduce from that, this short video, that there was a problem in the fascial system that was inhibiting and possibly coming from uh, you know, a, a previous problem that hadn't been addressed correctly in terms of fascia, okay? So we use our knuckles and elbows, okay? And it's a friction type movement, okay? And we work you know, reasonably fast and we're trying to aim down to that deep fascia layer, okay? And uh, the aim is always to work with a pattern of points that are related to each other through the model, okay? So if I might work for a while uh, with my knuckle, I can then you know, change to my elbow on the same point. And you know, I can use these, in, uh, these manual tools if you like. Okay, what do we think we're doing? We're manipulating uh, small densified areas of deep fascia that's gonna produce heat. And we've seen in the study that we did in 2010, it takes about 3.2 minutes for that you know, area to start sliding, gliding uh, a bit better and for the pain to drop down at least 50%. Now, over the last years, then there's been a lot of focus on, you know, well, what we actually do it. Okay, and what it seems to be is that we're triggering a chemical reaction in the extracellular matrix in those intrafascial layers that I talked about in the beginning that have a lot of hyaluronic acid in them. Okay, so this study from 2011, they actually quantified uh, the amount of hyaluronic acid. They found there's a lot in between the collagen fibre layers of deep fascia, but also a lot even more between the deep fascia and the epimesium. So um, hyaluronic acid, uh, when it aggregates in these very thin spaces, thin flat spaces, it doesn't act like the hyaluronin that are being injected into joint spaces, but this, if it aggregates here, it's aggregating because there's been immobilization, okay? Haven't been able to move, or I've had a fracture and I haven't, you know, I've been immobilized for that. And so it aggregates and becomes very viscous. It's no longer the lubricant that we think about in hyaluronic acid. Wonderful article by Rebecca Pratt here. She talks and, and illustrates it beautifully, all about the latest stuff about hyaluronin and, and fascia. This other article here, if you're interested in what happens after treatment. Okay, so these people from Poland, they looked at you know, the reaction that occurs in the 28, four, four to 48 hours after treatment. And the peak of the inflammatory reaction occurred in the 24, uh, at the end of the 24 hours. This study, of course, was probably, you know, the better one in terms of actually demonstrating with using a particular MRI. Now, Antonio talks about this one at length on the online lesson. Um, lesson so I won't go into it now because we're running short but I want you to focus here so we're talking about the elbow okay and this was an area that's red and densified okay before treatment so with the MRI they were able to treat 
and then get them back in the MRI and immediately after you see it's completely changed color, okay? On the other side, they didn't treat that. So it, it still remains red, okay? So here, red, it turns green. What it, It's actually indicating a change in the amount of bounded water, okay? So, and it's got to do with hyaluric acid. I won't, I won't go into it, it's quite complex. But when it aggregates, it becomes what we call unbounded and it dramatically increases the viscosity of the surrounding connective tissue. So uh, before treatment, red, a lot of unbounded water. After treatment, green means uh, bounded water. And it, that means that the tissue is able to slide and glide. So that's a good study uh, looking at what happens after treatment. Okay, so if we have our, um, you know, uh, our honeycomb set up here, epimesium, perimesium, epimesium, oh, sorry, endomesium, perimesium, epimesium. We have to also remember that our muscle spindles are inserted within the perimesium, okay? This is a photograph of a muscle spindle. It's not just lying anywhere in a muscle, okay? This is the muscle spindle. It has a connective tissue capsule. The connective tissue capsule is in continuity with the perimesium. Muscle spindles actually form within the perimesium. Okay, that's where they, they develop. Outside here, we have the extrafusal muscle fibers. Inside, the little blue interfusal muscle fibers. Okay, so wonderful photographs. It shows us where the muscle spindle is actually lying. So imagine if that perimesium is a bit stiff, not sliding, not gliding because perhaps up here on the, on the deep fascia, this epimesium is stiff and it, and it follows through, it's all connected. Same thing we think about with the Golgi tendon orbits, okay? And it has a connective tissue capsule onto which inserts muscle fibers. As we move through di different degrees of movement, then this Golgi tendon organ will inhibit fibers that we no longer need, okay? So the play between agonism and antagonism. So really interesting to think about where those receptors are actually placed and they're within the fascial system. Oh, we've looked at lots of different clinical aspects over the years, pain reduction, what happens during treatment, range of movement, pain and disability. I won't go into them now because we don't have time, but they're all in, these articles are all in the bibliography. And if you do go on PubMed, then you can always you know, just Google and put in Stecco and uh, lots of these studies and more studies. I'm always amazed when I go back and look, there's always more studies that are appearing, which is great. In fact, this particular latest study in 2022, once again, a, a Polish group, the Poles are, are really into fashion regulation in a big way. Um, we started teaching there in 2007. And so they've looked at the difference if I do a sham treatment, okay, as opposed to a true protocol, FM protocol treatment, and what happens, you know, and they were able to demonstrate that, that if you follow the protocol, it actually works better. So, you know, I love these sort of studies. Contraindications, quick one, fever, skin lesion in the treatment area, we just can't work on it. And recent thrombosis, I wouldn't do this deep fascial technique in any limb that's had a recent thrombosis or a history of thrombosis, uh, simply because of the, the, the amount of pressure that we need to get down to that deep fascial layer. Fever's a no-no because we're going to put in more inflammation into a plane. We're not going to get a normal reaction. There's several relative contributions, but, you know, uh, they go into this in detail in the online less, uh, lessons. So just to close up, we're basically looking at what are the indications? And we can just say, well, wherever there's reduced sliding of the fascial system, potentially we could be having a source of uh, you know, interruption in our proprioceptive information or interruption in our ability to recruit all of the, the motor units that we need for a movement. And so we can have a wide range of treatments that we, a wide range of symptoms that we treat. This is a photograph from last year's uh, FM teachers meeting. So you can see that, you know, a wide range of people from, as I said, so many different countries now, I lose track of them. Uh, 
I've just put my email in there because I just say thanks for listening to me. But you know, sometimes people take a while to get their 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 questions going, and um, I want you to be able to contact me and ask me questions that you you might be mulling over at the moment. Okay, so, well, that's all I had to say. It's a bit of a, a race through. Um, okay, and <laughs> I wonder if we do have any questions. Can we maybe open up the, the question part? Sure, Julie. That was brilliant. That was a really great overview and certainly enlightened me with regards to the, like you, I love anatomy, so it's really nice to see you know, so-called in the flesh, how those bonds link between different muscles. And it's not just an isolated muscle, but you've got the link between muscle systems and muscle functions. And yeah, that's good. Um, Lucian's got a question there. Can you see the questions? So Lucian asked, does the honeycomb fascia in the muscle change with strength exercise? Um, it doesn't, it, it won't change the... Um... The actual, you know, the, the, the honeycomb aspect, because they are, each muscle fiber is surrounded by its endomesium, it still remains uh, surrounded. Um, what we might see, and uh, it's not a study that they've been able to do, we, we, we could hypothesize that somebody who does a lot of exercise in a specific region would probably possibly have areas of the deep fascia that are more reinforced as opposed to somebody who doesn't. OK, um, but, you know, the overall structure wouldn't change because it, it has to be like that. You know, it, ha it is a honeycomb structure and that's just the way it is. Does that answer your question, Lucy? I get the feeling you're talking like with regards to when you strength train, you get your DOMS and that causes hypertrophy of the muscle. I think what you'll find there is it's going to increase the muscle size it's not going to really change the honeycomb structure. Yeah. Um, I guess I was also wondering because oh, if you think of a bodybuilder, I'm not a bodybuilder, but obviously the muscle physically gets bigger. So I was kind of wondering if there's changes within that because obviously the, the muscles ultimately allow the diameter and all that. So I'm assuming everything has to adapt to a certain extent. Um, and I don't know if the studies or research are looking into it's been done, but yeah, I'm curious. I can share some input into that answer. If you look at some of, um, I think his name's pronounced Jaya, K-J-A-E-R. He's in, I think he's a Danish researcher. He's done a lot of research of showing the adaptability and response of the connective tissue to mechanical load. Um, it's interesting actually talking about DOMS itself because that's actually a misnomer. It's actually um, connective tissue uh, soreness. So, and that's something that's been validated with uh, a few different studies. I know Jan Wilke in Germany, who's done quite a bit of research and the fascial system highlights that if you look at the structural damage, the connect connective tissue and its inflammatory response to mechanical load, it fits much more clearly with when people experience muscle soreness, even though it's actually more reflective of damage to the connective tissue network. That, that might be hinting on a... A back end thought in my head. <laughs> and is it what one of it? No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Jack, to clarify, you're saying it's damage to the peri, epi, and endomyceum as opposed to the muscle fiber? Yeah. And more specifically, the perimyceum as well. Um, yeah. I'll actually, I'll, I'll get this done and I can share it on the chat if you like, if you'd like to read further about it. Yeah. That'd be yeah. great. They've done some studies about what happens with stretching. And so actually what they're seeing is that the connective tissue actually starts to change after even only 12% of its length increase, okay? So 12% is not very much. So the conclusions from those studies is that whenever we're stretching, it's much more likely that we're stretching the connective tissue, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole structure of the fascial system rather than ever probably getting to stretch an actual muscle fiber. I've got a, a, when you ask that question, Julie, or mention that with regards to age, what's the general transition or translation of tissue as we age with regards to qualities of extensibility into the fascia? 
So the collagen fiber components change, okay, as we age. And so the actual fascial system does get stiffer, okay? Um, it's not as responsive to the elasticity, okay? It doesn't mean that it cannot be, but it just generally will become stiffer. Um, lots of interesting uh, aspects related to, uh, say, menopause and, and, and things and how the uh, hormonal changes will influence a lot the fascial system. So there's research done by the Strecker group, Katarina Fede in particular, um, about what hormonal receptors there are in the fascia. So with the difference between premenopausal uh, fascial and postmenopausal fascia. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, there's so much more that we need to to study and, and to know about it. But uh, so far there is changes with aging and, and with hormonal changes. Thank you. Kelly, did you have a question? You've come on video. Yeah, I do actually. Are there any um, uh, any thoughts about links um, of the fascial system with um, complex trauma or mental health um, trauma conditions? Yeah. In um, these, are, these are things that are addressed in, in level three and level four of uh, particularly level four. So the relationship perhaps with the psychogenic system, okay? And uh, it's not an area that's been researched as much as the musculoskeletal aspect so far, but certainly in the future it will be. Um, but um, recently we had a presentation at a conference that we had here in Padova by a friend of mine, and uh, she was talking about the relationship between you know emotions and the fascial system. And what I thought was really interesting uh, was that there is a strong connection between free nerve endings and the information that they send into the limbic system, okay? And so, you know, if you have a fascia that's not healthy, it's not giving the right information back to the limbic system, you may have, it could possibly be related to that kind of disconnect that can happen between mind and body, okay? So, um, and also the difficulty of recognizing emotions, et cetera. So, you know, it's nothing new that your mind and body are interconnected. Um, I guess this type of uh, information is helping us to understand how maybe the fascial system is involved in those problems. Yeah. And, and we would often talk about when we are doing in particular, this deep work on people, how the memory is is triggered. Okay, so I'm sure that you've done, you know, if you're doing deep any deep sort of work, even on trigger point work or you know deep massage, whatever, people remember things that they'd completely forgotten about. Okay, and so there is a, some hypothesis that there could be that correlation that we get things moving again in the fascial system. The free nerve endings are starting to feed back into the limbic system where the memory has been you know, stored, stored in the tissue. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Fascinating. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another question um, from Min who was interested in the hypermobility stuff. And yeah. it's Do you mind sharing your experience on using fascial manipulation on people who have a connective tissue disorder such as EDS? And I'm guessing that's Ella Danlos syndrome. Yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, it's interesting in Andalus syndrome because um, it, it seems to have a um, you know, tendency to be uh, perhaps passed on between generations in, in certain countries. So we have a lot of uh, people with Andalus and, and so a lot of experience from physiotherapists using FM in the Northern European countries, so Finland, Sweden, and Denmark. And so, you know, we wonder if there's genetic um, reasons for, for that and their experience now I can personally say that I've treated perhaps one or two people so not that many but there are people that work with them all the time um, and yeah you really need to think about the condition and we can do this deep pressure work we need to really think about what we want to stabilize uh, because rather than you know promoting uh, extensive um, 
movement in some areas, you want to help stabilize other areas, okay? So if we think about the myofascial unit, we are addressing monoticular components as well as biarticular components. With the centers of automation particularly focus on the monoticular component and the monoticular component in our musculoskeletal system are the stabilizers. So what they tell me is they get really good results with able to stabilize certain areas that need to be stabilized in their patients by improving that proprioceptive information from these areas and then you know they have less pain. Okay, obviously we cannot modify the genetic uh, I mean, the formation, let's say, or the, or the structure of their connective tissue, but we can help them to experience this pain. Because even though they're very mobile, we know that it can be very painful. I, I just like to say that I, you know, I have you know, meet up with some of you in person. Keep in mind my email if you want to write to me and ask specific things or about other things that are coming to me. Up as you've been thinking about this information, just do. And uh, yeah, I hope to meet with you in person one day. Thank you very much, yeah. Julia. We appreciate you taking the time to explain to us a bit more about fashion manipulation.